Hello everyone! If you have ever taken a psychology class or a neuroscience class, you have probably learned a concept called working memory. In the first part of this video, I'm going to talk about what working memory is and how it's different from short-term memory and long-term memory. In the second part of the video, we're going to take a look at the neural mechanism in the brain that's supporting working memory. In particular, what is population coding? Working memory is the ability to recall information we just learned. It's how we can remember things like Wi-Fi password and hotel room numbers. It is very important for the task of reading. You have to remember the previous sentence in order to understand the next sentence. And it's also very important for reasoning. When we do a math problem, we have to remember the instructions, the constraints of the problems, the steps we have already completed. So working memory is incredibly important for learning new things. And it's a measure of general intelligence. I think of Sherlock Holmes as a very intelligent person, and he seems to remember every detail from the environment vividly. His working memory capacity must be exceptionally high. Just a little bit more background. Working memory is sometimes also called short-term memory. Some researchers think they're exactly the same thing, but other researchers think there is a nuanced difference. Another definition of working memory is that you're doing something with short-term memory. You're not just holding a list of numbers in your head, but you're adding them together, subtracting them, and doing some sort of manipulation. What researchers do agree is that working memory is different from long-term memory. If I recall a phone number that I just learned versus if I recall my mom's phone number that I memorized 20 years ago, the brain activation pattern can be significantly different. And the hallmark of working memory is that it's a limited capacity. We can't remember everything we saw and everything we heard. Just how limited the capacity is has been an area of interest that sparked a lot of research. And we're going to learn more about it later in the video. Also, working memory decays over time. By the end of the video, you're going to forget some of the things you learned. And by the end of tomorrow, you're going to forget even more. Unfortunately, working memory is sensitive to aging. It typically declines after age 60 as the brain undergoes age-related changes. And that's why older adults typically have memory complaints. But the good news is that aerobic exercise can delay the decline of working memory and even strengthen it. So this is another reason we should go to the gym. So what is the neural mechanism supporting working memory? There are two competing models of working memory out there. On the left, we have the much older slot model. And on the right, we have the more recent spike model. And by the end of the video, we're going to see that there is more evidence supporting the spike model and researchers are starting to agree that we should probably retire the slot model in favor of the spike model. And let's take a look at what each of them is all about. First, we have the slot model. The idea of the slot model came from this paper written by Miller in 1956. And since then, it has been cited over 30,000 times, so it's extremely influential. And Miller was saying that the upper limit of our working memory capacity is the magic number 7 plus or minus 2. This comes from the observation that when you ask people to remember a list of words or a list of pictures or a list of numbers, people usually just remember about seven items. And exactly how many items we can remember is debatable. Later, we have a paper by Cohen suggesting that the magic number is really four. And if we do something called chunking, then we can manage to fit more information into these four slots. For example, the US phone numbers are broken into three chunks, and somehow it's easier for us to remember things when we group smaller units together. We also have some neural evidence supporting the slot model. Here we have a study called Capacity Limit of Visual Short-Term Memory in Human Posterior Parietal Cortex. They found that the more items we have to remember, the more neural activity was observed in the posterior parietal cortex. It is as if the brain is working harder to maintain more information. But the neural activity seems to hit a plateau when we reach the magic number 7. This suggests that we have a capacity limit right here. It's the idea that you can't drive any faster if you are flooring the gas pedal. And next, we are going to move away from the slot model and take a look at the spike model. The spike model is stochastic. It's not deterministic. This means that subscribers of this model don't believe that we can actually determine the exact upper limit of working memory capacity. It's not necessarily 7 plus or minus 2. But rather, they think that working memory is a pool of stochastic resources. 
there is some randomness involved in the process of how this pool of resources are distributed. And under the spike model, working memory can be allocated to an infinite number of items, much more than just 7 plus or minus 2. And you might think, how is that possible? How can we remember an infinite number of things? The answer is that we can do this by sacrificing the quality of the memory. For example, if I ask you to remember what the sky looks like and I take away the image, you can probably do a really good job with retrieving this image in your mind's eye. But if I ask you to remember what these hundreds of people look like and I take away this image, you can probably only come up with a vague, fuzzy picture. This is the idea of high resolution and low resolution. We can either remember a few things very well or many things very poorly. And the more we must remember, the more noise we have in our neural representations and the memory will become more fuzzy. And we eventually fail to remember when the noise overwhelms the signal. And let's take a look at the behavioral evidence for the spike model. This is a famous experimental design called the analog recall task. The task has three phases. First, you have to encode some visual stimuli. Here we have these four lines that are in different locations and they have different orientations. And in the second phase, they take away the visual stimuli. And finally, you have to recall the visual information that you just memorized. Using a dial, you can indicate earlier I saw a line here and this is the orientation that I remembered. And the answer here is actually not correct. The person is making an error. The line here is about 30 degrees, but the person is saying that they saw something uh, that's 60 degrees. So they were off by 30 degrees. And if we plot the errors on the right, we see that when people have to memorize just one item, most people are getting it right. There is just a small degree of errors. But when people have to memorize two, four, and eight items, the distribution of it, their error is getting wider and wider. The distribution is flattening out. And this goes back to the idea that we can either remember one things with high resolution or many things with lower resolution. And if we take the image that we just saw and we plot the error variance against the number of items, we have a nice linear relationship here. When you have to remember more items, your memory becomes fuzzier and the error variance becomes wider. And notice that there is no discontinuity around the magic number 7. If we are operating under the assumptions of the slot model, we would expect to see something special happening here when we are reaching the magic number 7, the working memory capacity limit. But there is nothing special going on around here. And next we are going to learn about population coding. Population coding is proposed as the neural evidence for the spike model. Let's say we have some visual stimulus here. It's a line with an orientation of 45 degrees. And when we see this line, we have neurons in our brain that are firing. And in particular, some neurons are getting really excited. These are individual neurons that have a preferred orientation. And when I first learned about this, I thought it was very interesting. As individuals, we can have a favorite color, a favorite movie, a favorite song. And similarly, an individual neuron can have a favorite orientation, a favorite color, or a favorite motion. And when their favorite feature, in this case, an orientation of 45 degrees, is detected, it's going to fire rapidly. The neuron is still going to fire if you see a 30 degree line or a 50 degree line, but it's going to fire at a reduced rate. But when we see a stimulus, we don't have one neuron that's firing. Instead, we have a population of neurons that are firing. Here, each square represents a neuron. An information such as orientation is encoded by the combined activity of a pool of neurons. And because we are seeing a 45 degree orientation, the neuron whose favorite feature is a 45 degree orientation is going to fire most rapidly and that's represented by the highlighted color. And when we have many items to remember, in this case, four different lines, the same pool of resources is divided over multiple items. And here, we don't have a strong signal that's standing out compared to previously when you just have one item to remember. The total activity here is dispersed across many items. It's not as focused. And you can think of the pool of resources 
as underlying working memory capacity as the total firing rates from a population of neurons. When we have one item to remember, the neuron that prefers this feature is going to fire rapidly. But when we have multiple items competing for attention, the same neuron is going to decrease its firing rate and it's not going to stand out or pop out. And this is the idea of low resolution. When we have more information to remember, we're going to sacrifice the resolution of the memory because we have the same finite pool of resources. And this is the idea of normalization. It means that the total firing rates are going to remain constant no matter the number of items we have to memorize. Next, we have some compelling evidence from functional MRI imaging that supports the idea of normalization. So on the top here, we have the stimulus page. So think of this as a participant is shown a blue dot and a red dot and you have to remember the location of each dot. When people have to remember a single item, for example, the blue dot, we see this concentrated activity of, of a population of neurons that are firing. And as you move down to these pictures, we see that the location of the activity corresponds to the blue dot. But when people have to remember two items now, they have to remember both the blue dot and the red dots where they are, we see that the same pool of resources is split into two, corresponding to the two dots. And this concentrated activity now is weakened because it has to be shared across two items. Now, how does population coding explain how we recall information? Let's go back to the example. We have a visual stimulus that's aligned with an orientation of 45 degrees. And when we see this line, we have a population of neurons that's firing in our brain. And the neuron that's most sensitive to 45 degrees are going to fire most rapidly. And if I take away the image, we can still use our working memory to come up with the picture in our mind's eye. So how does that happen? Turns out after the stimulus is gone, we still have some leftover neural activity that's still going on in our brain. And we recall information by decoding the stimuli from the neural activity using maximum likelihood. To understand this picture, each black dot represents a neuron like the squares on the right. And let's say we can measure the neural activity of someone, but we don't know what kind of visual stimuli they saw, but we observe that the neuron that's firing most rapidly is the 45 degree neuron. And we can make the deduction that they probably saw a line with an orientation of 45 degrees. And that is the mechanism of how we retrieve information from our working memory. And the nice thing about population coding is that it's a robust system. Because the encoded information is distributed over many neurons, we can damage a single neuron and that's going to have little impact on the entire memory representation. So if I hit my head and some of my neurons have died, I'm still going to keep my memory because memory isn't stored in a single neuron, but rather it's distributed across a population of neurons. And let's summarize what we have learned today. We saw that working memory is our capacity to recall information. It is a limited resource and it decays over time. We have more neural evidence supporting the spike model compared to the older slot model. And the spike model says that we encode and retrieve information via population coding. Population coding is the idea that we have an entire population of neurons in our brain that is firing to maintain working memory representations. And that's how we can remember things like a list of numbers, pictures and words. Inside the population, we have individual neurons and individual neurons have a favorite feature and that could be an orientation, a color, a motion. And they're going to fire most rapidly when their favorite feature is detected. We know that working memory capacity is a limited pool of resources and we can think of the resources as the total firing rates available from a population of neurons. This finite pool of resources can be divided over many items and even an infinite number of items that we want to memorize. But because the resources are finite, we can either remember a few things really well with high resolution or many things very poorly with low resolution. 
So in order to maintain more items in our working memory, we must sacrifice the quality of the memory. And that is all we have today. If you learned something useful, please hit the like button.